previously on the keys of time. We now have the keys that are necessary to start to systematically unveil the Bible's chronology. The first two keys revealed the divinely ordained blueprint or framework for time, which governs the progression of God's plan. Keys one and two basically say that the blueprint is a week of seven days of 1,000 years each. The next two keys resulted in the discovery of God's redemption chronology, which exists alongside the Bible's actual chronology. Key 3 says, at the end of every jubilee cycle of 49 actual years, God adds a special 50th year of grace. This must be a measurement in the redemption chronology. Key 4 is the principle of unreckoned time, which says that God does not count times when his people's sin causes his plan of redemption to be suspended. This is convincingly revealed by the 479 completed years recorded in 1 Kings 6.1, which are 131 years short of the actual time. Now, the total times of servitude are also 131 years. So if they are subtracted from the total time, this gives exactly 479 years. The only alternative to this solution is to force the periods in Judges and Acts 13.20, which add up to 610 years, to fit into the 479 years of 1 Kings 6.1. This involves torturing the scriptures. On the other hand, when the key of redemption chronology with its unreckoned times is accepted, there is a perfect harmony of all the stated times. Again, this requires the existence of a separate redemption chronology in which the years out of fellowship are not counted. These latter keys define how time is reckoned on the redemption chronology. They are like counting the number of days of pay owed to an employee. Weekends are not reckoned because work is suspended then, that's key four. But bank holidays, are, which are like jubilees, are added as extra days, even though no work was done. Hence they are days of grace. And this corresponds to key number three. So whereas keys one and two define the structure of time that governs the redemption chronology, keys three and four tell us how redemption time, as counted by God, relates to actual time, as counted by man. This is important because the progression of time within God's overall blueprint is according to redemption time, not actual time. We have now tracked the whole progress of time from the Exodus to the dedication of the temple. We have found that scripture gives a complete and detailed record of this time, except for three gaps in the record. Do we have to guess at these missing times? Would God give a lot of detailed chronological information only to miss a few pieces that are vital so that we could never have the complete picture of time? Is God teasing us by giving us most but not all of the chronology? Surely not. The fact that so much of scripture tells us about time spans shows us that chronology is important to God. It's illogical that he would give us incomplete information. Surely his revelation must be perfect and complete without missing periods. Now, on a superficial reading, there are gaps. But by comparing scriptures and by knowing the keys of time, we can fill in these gaps. These gaps were left by God on purpose. He put the answer under the surface for us to find. He wanted us to dig deeper in his word to discover his ways. As Proverbs 25 2 says, It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. It's our royal honor to search out these things that God has concealed from the natural mind. When we do this by faith, with the help of the Holy Spirit and using the keys of time revealed in his word, we find the Bible's chronology is indeed complete and perfect with every part fitting into place, leaving no place for man's speculation. 
As with any area of Bible study, the natural man is unable to understand it, for it's spiritually discerned, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. God designed Bible chronology to only be accessible to believers who rely on the illumination of the Holy Spirit and who are committed to the truth of God's Word. It is no mere intellectual exercise. We will now apply the keys of time to help us fill in these three gaps. You see, Scripture gives us three long measurements of time by which we can calculate these three gaps. Firstly, the 450 years of Acts 13, 19 and 20. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Secondly, the 480 redemption years of 1 Kings 6 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And thirdly, the 490 year redemption cycle. We will now use these to fill in the three gaps. Let's look at the first gap, which was the period of time between the division of the land to the first servitude. The 450 year period tells us that this first gap must be 20 years. If you add up all the known periods, starting with the first servitude until the end of Eli's time, you get 8 plus 40 plus 40 plus 18 plus 80 years plus 20 years, plus 40 years, plus 7 years, plus 88 years. Plus 18 years, plus 31 years. plus 40 years, plus 40 years, making a grand total of 430 years. These periods cover the whole of the 450 years, except the unknown period, the gap. Therefore, the time from the division of the land to the first captivity had to be 450 take away 430 years, in other words, 20 years. This result is confirmed by considering the ages of Joshua, Caleb and Othniel, who was the first judge. We know that Joshua was older than Caleb. At the division, Joshua was old and stricken in years. That's Joshua 13.1. Now Joshua was old, advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, You are old, advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. While well, Caleb was a lively 85-year-old. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. Joshua died at 110, according to Joshua 24. Now it came to pass, after these things, that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And he was followed in death 
by the remainder of his generation. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Then Israel sinned and went into the first servitude for eight years, until they cried out and God raised up a deliverer, Othniel, who reigned for forty years. That's Judges 3, 8 to 12. Othniel's timeline places a constraint on the length of this gap. We see Othniel earlier at the division of the land in Joshua chapter 15, verse 15 to 17, when he conquers a city and marries 85-year-old Caleb's daughter. Now, if the gap was more like 40 years, as some have it, we find that Othniel's age is improbably high at each stage. On the other hand, if the gap was much less than 20 years, then Joshua's timeline runs into trouble. You see, the shorter gap would not provide enough time for Joshua's remaining years after the division, and for the elders of his generation that ruled after his time to die off, and for the national decline after these elders had all died off, which resulted in the first servitude. Let's look now at the second gap, which was the time from Samuel's victory at Mizpah to the start of Saul's reign. Once we know the first gap, we can also deduce the second gap. We can find this missing time from the 480 redemption years of 1 Kings 6 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. We know all the other time periods that make up these 480 years. If we add up the total of all these periods that we already know, from the Exodus to the end of the 480th redemption year in Nizan, and we do not count the 131 years of servitude under foreign dominion, as they are unreckoned in the, in the redemption chronology, we get two years, plus 38 years, plus seven years, plus 20 years, plus 40 years, plus 80 years, plus 40 years, plus 88 years. plus 31 years, plus 40 years, plus 40 years, plus 40 and a half years of David, plus three and a half years, plus one year, making a grand total of 471 years. This is nine years short of the total as given by 1 Kings 6 1. Therefore, the missing time from the victory at Mizpah to Saul's reign must be 480 minus 471, that is nine years, in order to get the correct total of 480 years in 1 Kings 6 1. So we see that 1 Kings 6.1 is in harmony with the rest of the Bible once it's understood that it does not include the unreckoned years. Thus, if you count the total years defined by 1 Kings 6.1, they come to 611 years. Once you subtract off the 131 unreckoned years, you are left with exactly 480 years. Let's now look at the third gap, which is the time of furnishing the temple before it was dedicated. The final act of furnishing the temple took place on the day of its dedication. That's when the Ark of the Covenant 
was brought into the Holy of Holies. As this was done, the glory of the Lord filled the temple, as we're told in 1 Kings 8. The whole nation was gathered to Jerusalem for this very special event at the Feast of Tabernacles. We read in 1 Kings 8 2, Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is Tishri, which is the seventh month. Then Solomon dedicated the temple, as we read in 1 Kings 8. This great event, with the manifestation of God's glorious presence in their midst, was a consummation of God's redemptive purposes for Israel that began with their deliverance at the Exodus. This is why 1 Kings 6 1 linked this beginning of the Exodus with its glorious conclusion in the building and dedication of the temple. Now, the redemption time from the Exodus to the completion of the building was 480 plus five and a half years, making 485 and a half years. It's surely significant that this jubilee event, when the glory filled the temple, was very near to the end of a great 490 year jubilee cycle. In fact, the 490 year redemption cycle finished after just another four and a half years. It's evident that this divine intervention of grace, a turning point in Israel's history, must have taken place within the Jubilee year at the end of this 490 year cycle. This great event with the manifestation of God's glory marked the end of this great Jubilee cycle. This was a great Jubilee for Israel with a demonstration of God's grace, favor and blessing upon Israel. Just as her first 490-year cycle ended with God's manifested glory in the Exodus, so now her second 490-year cycle ends with his manifested glory. In this way, he marked the end of this major redemption cycle and the start of the next. Why didn't God tell us the year of the dedication of the temple, even though it was such a major event? He hid it, because he wanted us to discover it through the 490-year Jubilee Principle. The reason that it happened six months later rather than on the anniversary of the Exodus was that it was a major fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, and so it had, had to happen at Tabernacles. He brought them out, you see, from the hand of the enemy through the Passover at the Exodus in order to bring them into the presence of his glory at Tabernacles. These two great jubilee events typify two stages in the greater drama of our redemption through Christ, and so they had to take place on two different feast days. Therefore, the total time of furnishing the temple was the four and a half years until the end of the 490 years at the 14th day of the first month, plus the extra six months leading up to tabernacles that year on the 15th day of the seventh month when the temple was dedicated. This makes a total of five years, which is about the length of time we would expect for such a great and expensive project. Later we'll see that this approach of locating the dedication of the temple at the end of the 490 year Great Jubilee cycle from the Exodus is confirmed by the fact that it results in the next period of Israel's history being a perfect 490 year Great Jubilee cycle. That is, the period of time from the dedication of the temple to the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, which initiates the final 490-year Great Jubilee cycle of Daniel's 70 weeks, this period of time turns out to be a perfect Great Jubilee cycle of 490 years. Thus, God's word is written in such a way that it requires some spiritual discernment involving the nature of Jubilee to unveil his pattern of time. Bible chronology, you see, is not just number crunching. It's a revelation of the divine nature. It should be noted that Denny originally estimated the time of furnishing the temple as 490 minus 487 years. That's, he made it three years. But we have followed his logic, but we've fine-tuned it for greater accuracy. God revealed the time of furnishing the temple, therefore, through the 490-year Jubilee Principle. This time was not given on the surface of Scripture, as God wanted us to discover it using this principle, of 490 years, initially revealed in Daniel 9.24.
Although it's not given directly, Scripture gives us enough information to find it out. Having revealed the keys of time, he expects us to use these keys to open up his treasure chest, the treasure chest of the Bible chronology. If we do not use the keys, we will be unable to reconstruct the Bible's chronology. Our record of time will be incomplete, leaving it up to us to guess it. So now we have shown that the total number of years experienced by man during this 490 year forgiveness cycle was actually 621 years. The difference of these totals, 621 minus 490, that is 131 years, this difference must be the total unreckoned time. So let's now add up the times of the servitudes and let's see if they actually do come to 131 years. The first servitude under Kushan Rishathim was eight years. The second servitude under Eglon, king of Moab, was 18 years. The third servitude under Jabin, king of Canaan, was 20 years. The fourth servitude under the Midianites was seven years. The fifth servitude under the Philistines and Ammonites was 18 years. The sixth servitude was 40 years, that was under the Philistines. And the seventh servitude, again under the Philistines, was 20 years. If we add up these times, that's eight years, 18 years, and 20 years, and seven years, and 18 years, and 40 years and 20 years, that adds up to 131 years. So if we add up the times of the servitudes, they indeed do come to 131 years. So we see that all the scriptures harmonize, and all the pieces fit together perfectly into God's overall structure of time, which reveals the sovereign plan of the Lord of time, and incorporates his spiritual principles of grace. Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. Today I want to introduce you to a, what I believe is a very special book called The Keys of Time, a revelation of Bible chronology. This book will give you a thorough grounding in the exciting subject of Bible chronology, revealing the keys by which you can unlock the treasure chest of God's Word concerning its revelation of time. And so we start, you see, by looking at the major keys that will unlock this treasure chest, like the fact that all time is based on the creation week, and one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and we look into the Jubilee and how that also unlocks how God measures time. And we look at the principle of unreckoned time. And as we see the whole revelation of God in history and time, fit together perfectly, we will get out of this, we'll get a revelation of the glory of God as the sovereign Lord of time, the God who is working out his purposes of grace in his perfect time, according to his redemption timetable. So through this book, God will impart to you a rich understanding of the times, giving you a fresh revelation of the special time in which we're now living near the end of the age and it will prepare you for the momentous events that are just ahead because we are living in the last days and we need to understand the times that we're living in we need to understand God's revelation of time in the Bible 
And having discovered the keys and God's framework of time, we, we then go through each period of history, starting from Adam to Abraham, and then from Abraham to the Exodus, and then from the Exodus to the dedication of Solomon's temple, and then the period of time leading up to the, the decree to restore Jerusalem by Artaxerxes, and then finally Daniel's 70 weeks that take us to the coming of the Messiah himself and his death and resurrection. We look and we show how all the pieces fit together perfectly into God's framework of time. And by the end of the book, you will know how to get the date of every event, every major event in the Bible, and, and how all these events fit together. And so this will enrich your understanding of the whole Bible and how it all fits together perfectly. And there are DVDs that go with this book that will enhance your study of it.